at a bank outside Los Angeles. A nighttime explosion that no one hears. Cunning criminals no one sees. It's the perfect burglary in which cash and bandits vanish without a trace. With little to go on, the FBI must use instinct and determination to solve a case that seems impossible to crack. a brazen yet simple crime. A mask, a gun, a note passed to a teller. But bank burglary is different. It takes skill to disable an alarm, to penetrate a locked vault. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In 1972, the largest bank burglary in US history went down without a hitch. $8 million, gone. Now agents must track a gang of sophisticated criminals. With enough money, to disappear forever. Laguna Niguel, California, March 27th, 1972. It's Monday morning at the United California Bank. Employees prepare to open for business. When the bank manager tries to unlock the vault door, it won't open. Somebody call a safe company. A technician from the vault manufacturer arrives 20 minutes later to check the door's locking system. He works for hours. The combination is right, the tumblers are in place, but unexplainably, even the expert can't get it open. It's not working. Looking for another way in, the technician climbs into the rafters above the vault. He is stunned to find a hole cut in the roof. Below, a second gaping hole leading to the vault. Agents from the FBI Santa Ana Resident Agency immediately respond to the bank. The first investigator to survey the cluttered crime scene is Special Agent Jim Conway. Upon arriving and getting up on the vault and looking down at this hole, we could see a pile of rubble, uh, I would say six feet tall and expanding out. Once inside the vault, the technician discovers a screwdriver jammed into the lock's gears. Agents suspect the thieves wanted to delay the discovery of the crime. The place is a disaster. My first impression was there was gonna be a lot of time and effort needed to work this out. It was something we couldn't just plow into because we had a crime scene. We were able to walk in, a few of us, and look around and see what the extent was as best we could determine. But we're walking over watches and rings and valuables and everything else because it was all piled into this big uh, cement mess. Special Agent Frank Calley begins sorting through the chaos. Just everything was thrown all over the place. There, uh, the locks of hair, um, all kinds of check statements, uh, photographs, uh, things that people would normally put in the, in the in a safety deposit box. I remember seeing the urns with ashes of deceased people uh, in there. The agents begin the arduous task of determining how the burglars entered the seemingly impenetrable vault. They notice dark soil and pieces of burlap mixed with the cement rubble. Outside, they find the bank's audible alarm disabled. 
they also find a ladder. Interpreting the clues, investigators piece together the burglar's intricate plan to breach the vault. They disabled the alarm by injecting it with liquid styrofoam. It hardened, freezing the clapper in place and rendering the alarm useless. Then the burglars climbed onto the roof. Investigators find tape on a rooftop outlet, suggesting the burglars used the bank's electricity. When agents cannot find fingerprints on the tape, they conclude the burglars wore gloves. Fully powered, the burglars sawed a four-foot opening into the roof. Once inside the rafters, they clearly knew how to bypass the interior silent alarm system. They took a couple of uh, the wires and that would have normally transmitted the alarm signal, and then they clipped them both and soldered them together. It was delicate, highly skilled work. I knew right away they, 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 they were smart. They did the homework. Even with the alarm disabled, 16 inches of steel-reinforced concrete stood between the burglars and the contents of the vault. The only way through, an intensely powerful blast. Agents believe the bandits drilled holes into the cement, then inserted dynamite and electric blasting caps. blast had to be precisely directed to blow through the cement without injuring the burglars or attracting attention. Agents conclude that the burlap fragments in the soil in the vault indicate that the burglars came prepared. They placed the, the burlap bags over the explosive, not only to muffle the sound, but also it would direct the, the charge into the, into the vault itself and, and keep the charge going into the concrete where they wanted it rather than coming back out where they were. The investigators discover burn marks on the steel rebar that reinforces the cement. They conclude that the burglars knew the blast could not crack steel and came prepared with an acetylene torch. Agents turn their attention to assessing the total loss. Bank officials report $50,000 is missing from cash drawers. But the thieves were not content with the cash. They took the time to break into 458 safe deposit boxes. Investigators find tool marks on the locks of the boxes and deduce the burglars used a pointed instrument and a lot of brute force to break them open one by one. They carefully sorted through every item, leaving behind what they didn't want. Amazingly, the bandits were so methodical that they got in and out without being seen or heard. In 1972, most banks were closed on weekends. Agents conclude that the suspects took full advantage of that fact. Apparently, they had been in there several times, in and out over the weekend. It probably went in on a Friday night, and they probably didn't get out there late Sunday night. 
Not only had the burglars pulled off such a lengthy, complex crime, they did it without leaving a single fingerprint. Although investigators do find a brown cotton glove and broken drill bits, neither is unique enough to be traceable. Agents and deputies collect the debris for further examination at the crime lab. But with no apparent evidence and no witnesses, agents are facing the tough challenge of identifying and locating a group of highly skilled criminals, including electronics and explosives experts. Investigators turn their attention to determining the total loss from the safe deposit boxes. It will be extremely difficult since banks do not keep records of their contents. Ordinarily, if you had a bank burglary, you would be missing cash. You'd go out and say, yes, we've got to find $350,000 worth of cash. At this point, we did not know what was gone. It's a very affluent area. And so the possibilities of a tremendous amount of money and material being lost was, uh, was evident. Investigators begin the arduous task of carefully sorting and cataloging every item left in the vault. Then, by interviewing every box holder, agents learn the details of missing jewelry, rare gold coins, and bearer bonds. By a process of elimination, they slowly create a list of the stolen goods. The bank's loss of $50,000 in cash pales by comparison as the value of the missing items rises to over $8 million. The heist has now become the largest bank burglary in U.S. history. With no physical evidence to go on, investigators hope to develop leads by thinking like the bandits. We felt that uh, they would need oxygen to burn the, the rebar. And so we canvass hospitals, oxygen supply places, and things like that. Despite checking every oxygen supplier in the area, agents come up with nothing. We also felt that a drill of some type had to be used, obviously a large one, so we canvassed places to find if anybody had sold or rented a large drill, as we felt it would have to be used. Again, Agents go to dozens of equipment shops, checking records during the time surrounding the break-in. But they find no suspicious purchases or rentals. Clearly, the criminals in this case have masterminded and pulled off a nearly perfect heist. With no witnesses, no direct clues, and certainly no suspects, it seems impossible to solve. But the FBI is determined to identify the burglars and find them wherever they are. In March 1972, a professional crew of burglars blasted their way into a bank vault in Laguna Niguel, California, near Los Angeles. Over a weekend, they emptied hundreds of safe deposit boxes, made off with more than $8 million in cash and valuables, then disappeared without a trace. Agents believe they are an experienced band of criminals. The case is difficult to crack for the small Santa Ana FBI office. Needing more resources, they seek the help of the larger Los Angeles FBI field office. Special Agent Paul Chamberlain supervises the investigation. At the time, it was our conclusion that this was the largest bank burglary in the history of the United States. We went to just about everyone in the office. It was several hundred agents. And, and that's not a typical response, but it became apparent that the crime was a significant crime. The Santa Ana agents quickly briefed the Los Angeles office on the details. <laughs> We'd not had a bank burglary like that in recorded history in, in the Los Angeles division. Uh, Burglaries that did occur with banks involved a small effort, and this was a systematic, big-time operation that lasted over three days. Since the burglars seem to be highly skilled professionals, yet have not struck Los Angeles before, agents conclude that they're probably from out of town. 
an agent sends a teletype to all other FBI offices, asking if anyone knows of similar bank burglaries. They get a hit from the Cleveland, Ohio field office, where agents have been investigating similar bank heists, 13 of them, in fact. The description of the California burglary immediately strikes a chord with them, including Special Agent Buddy Nix. We knew from the modus operandi, the MO, the outside alarm had styrofoam uh, spray placed in it to keep the audible alarm from activating. The fact that it was a roof job, the fact that the alarm system had been bypassed were all indications that the bank burglar crews in Youngstown very well may have been involved. The Ohio agents believe the 13 Ohio bank heists were committed by the Youngstown Erie Bank Burglary Group, a loose association of criminals tied to organized crime. The California agents were right. These are no small-time crooks. Youngstown at that time was just a mecca for organized crime act activities. I mean, they controlled the illegal gambling businesses, and they they were you know very much involved uh, in uh, interstate transportation of stolen property and and tractor trailer uh, thefts. And there were burglary crews that were operating, and there were a lot of very sophisticated burglaries that were taking place at that time. As part of earlier investigations. The Youngstown, Ohio agents have identified nearly 100 men believed to be part of the burglary group. They've collected intelligence on each of them. Agents send the men's names and mug shots to the Los Angeles FBI. There, investigators try to narrow the list. Since the criminals must have traveled to California, Agents check airline passenger manifests from around the time of the burglary. Without the benefit of modern computers, it is a time-consuming process done by hand. After an exhaustive search, they find the names of five men from the Youngstown list who had boarded a recent flight to Los Angeles. That's great. Emil Dinzio, Harry Barber, Charles Mulligan, Charles Brockles, and Philip Christopher arrived in California nine days before the heist. A sixth man, James Dinzio, came in on a different flight the day before the burglary. Finally, agents have developed suspects. And his brother, Emil Dinzio. Agents review the intelligence gathered on the six members of the burglary group. All have long records for home and small business burglaries and have done little jail time. Emil Dinzio appears to be the brains of the gang, the leader. He plans the jobs and handpicks the team to pull them off. Charles Brockles is an explosives and electronics expert, well-versed in bank alarms. Agents believe Philip Christopher is a lookout for the gang. The other gang members are all relatives of the leader and probably help with the grunt work. There's Emil's older brother, James. Face only a mother could love and Charles Mulligan, Emil's brother-in-law. Here, you're gonna really appreciate this guy. Yeah, I There's got, also I got Emil's here. nephew, Harry Barber. Okay, why don't you take a look at this guy? The men are all seasoned professional criminals, well-connected in organized crime. The Youngstown, Ohio FBI has linked them circumstantially to many bank burglaries, but never had direct evidence. He's the charges nobody. never stuck. He's a nobody, not a heavyweight, but we gotta... The only information that links the suspects to the crime is that they were all in Los Angeles at the time of the burglary. Agents begin the difficult job of tracking their movements, starting at the airport. We then canvassed and interviewed every cab driver at LAX 
that was working that day. That was a massive project. If I had, uh, if I showed you a couple pictures... Agents spend days interviewing dozens of drivers. It finally pays off. One cab driver recalls taking a group of five men to a home in the nearby community of Southgate. He remembers the trip well. The cab driver specifically remembered these folks for, for two reasons. One, because of the $100 tip, but for the other reason, they were tough, mean-looking guys. Agents get the address from taxi records and decide to go there. But it is a risk. Agents fear that if the suspects find out they're investigating the burglary, they might skip town. They have to take the chance. It is their only lead, according to Special Agent Jim Conway. But we had to interview somebody. We had to get our investigation started. And we were concerned that, naturally, that the rest of them would be aware that we were at least that close to identifying them. Agents learn that the Southgate house belongs to the Barber family. Ronald Barber, the brother of suspect Harry Barber, agrees to an interview but is elusive. We did not have a warrant or anything at that particular time. We had nothing positively to tie him to it. But the more he talked, the more he seemed to know, and uh, the more uh, we were impressed that uh, he knows a whole lot. Ronald Barber claims the six men were never at his house. Agents still have no direct evidence. Yet they believe Barber's story may be at least partially true. They note that the house seems too small to accommodate Ronald and six other men staying there. Agents conclude that at least some of them likely stayed elsewhere. So agents spread out, checking one hotel after another, starting with those closest to the bank Special Agent Frank Kelly. We figured these fellows were high rollers. They knew they were going to get a big haul, so they were going to stay at a nice place. So we were knocking on the doors of every fine hotel in the L.A., Orange County area. It is more tedious, time-consuming footwork. Thank you very much. But they do not give up. Sir, I'm with the FBI. On a hunch, one agent decides to take a different approach. There was an agent who... Uh, figured that uh, maybe they didn't stay at the best hotels, and he took it upon himself to walk into a truck stop hotel. And lo and behold, he found out that uh, Emil Denzio had stayed there. You're sure? You're sure positive. Emil Denzio is the leader of the burglary group. But they would have been together all five. Records show his brother-in-law, Charles Mulligan, also rented a room there around the time of the heist. Agents check Mulligan's registration card and find a license plate number. Denzio. They trace it to the Southgate address of Ronald Barber. Investigators now have seven suspects, the six from Ohio and the local Ronald Barber. They still have nothing directly linking the men to the crime. But the investigation is finally rolling forward, and the FBI is closing in. Weeks after a well-planned multi-million dollar bank burglary in Southern California, the FBI identifies seven suspects. Ringleader Emil Dinzio and his brother James Dinzio, Charles Mulligan, Philip Christopher, and Charles Brockles, and Harry Barber and his brother Ronald Barber. A notorious gang of professional thieves based in Youngstown, Ohio. Agents determine at least two of the men stayed at an area motel days before the heist. Special Agent Paul Chamberlain is convinced the men are responsible, but he has no evidence to prove it. By reference and innuendo, you, you kind of knew who was involved, but you need to have the evidence in federal court. Agents subpoena the motel phone records and find a series of calls to a local man named Earl Dawson. Our background investigation concluded he was a former um, military a Marine guy with some training in uh, munitions, explosives. Uh, and in as much as we had uh, major explosions that occurred at the bank, it became interesting to us. 
Special Agent Frank Kelly learns of another interesting connection. Yeah, we're gonna be down on... Dawson is from Youngstown, Ohio, the base of operations for the burglary group. So there's a, the light goes off again, and, and we say, well, now we got another break. We got the connection somehow between the boys from Youngstown, the Denzios, and, 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 their, and their cohorts in Dawson. The agents decide to approach Dawson at his house to convince him he should cooperate. They show him pictures of Emil Dinsio and his associates and ask if he knows them. Dawson is reluctant to talk. I was in the Corps as well. Knowing Dawson is a former Marine, Special Agent Callie appeals to his sense of duty. Er was a very patriotic individual, and I'm a former Marine, and we just kind of played that. I said, come on, Earl, you know, you're a former Marine, you've served your country. I said, what's well, important, Earl, it's a big case. And he said, what is it? I said, heard about that bank burglary down in Laguna Niguel? Callie's tactic works. Dawson comes clean. He admits knowing three of the suspects, Emil Dincio, Emil's brother James, and Charles Mulligan. He and Mulligan are old friends who grew up together in Youngstown. Dawson tells Callie that the day before the Laguna Niguel heist, Mulligan came to his house with the other suspects. Mulligan gave him $100 to leave the house for a few hours so they could hold a meeting. Dawson left without hearing what they discussed. But Dawson adds that he does have something the agents might want to see. He shows up the other day. Mulligan left a car in his garage. It's still there. It is a huge break. Perhaps the car holds the evidence they've been looking for. But before they can check it out, they're interrupted. While I'm talking to him, the phone rings. He answers the phone and he picks it up. And he points to the phone and he mouths the word Mulligan. Thinking quickly, Agent Callie asks Dawson's permission to eavesdrop, a legal requirement for using what he hears in court. Dawson signals that there is another phone in the bedroom. Mulligan comes out and says, uh, hey, the, has anybody, has the FBI been around? Dawson says, no, they, they're not around. I think I've almost had a laugh myself at the time listening to this. He's playing a beautiful role out there. He's really flip-flop. He's on our side now. Mulligan explains that he knows the FBI has been asking questions about him and his cohorts, and that they're getting worried. And he's heading back to the Los Angeles area. Mulligan said, uh, uh, I'm, I want to come out tonight and uh, to see us. I'm going to move the, my, the car in the garage. Agent Callie seizes the opportunity to trap Mulligan, but he fears that he might be setting up Dawson yeah, yeah, that'd be great. and the FBI. He didn't know for sure that this officer, he could be sitting across the street at the time watching us, for all we know, with our FBI car sitting out front. Callie instructs Dawson to arrange a meeting with Mulligan in a public place. Dawson tells Mulligan to meet him at his favorite bar, the Walnut Room. Mulligan agrees. Okay, now agents have a chance to inspect the car Mulligan left in the garage. But it does not belong to Dawson, so he cannot give them permission to search it. Through the window, they can see a pair of brown cotton gloves, exactly like the one found in the vault. The back seat is covered in what appears to be cement dust, similar to the debris found at the crime scene. It is the probable cause agents need to obtain a search warrant for the car. They also obtain an arrest warrant for Charles Mulligan and set up surveillance at the Walnut Room. Plainclothes agents position themselves inside the bar, not far from Dawson. We staked it out, so to speak. We, four of us were inside waiting, and uh, we had a couple of men outside waiting for him to arrive. Dawson introduces Agent Callie to some regulars as a buddy from the Marine Corps. The agents have to look natural, 
while staying sharp. Earl Dawson's safety is their primary concern. We didn't know what was going to happen, so we had to protect Earl. Agents devise a method for Callie and Dawson to communicate. Either one of them can signal the other by simply going to the restroom where they will meet. Three hours later, Mulligan finally arrives. He appears to be alone and greets his old friend, who tries to get him to talk about the heist. I didn't want to be too close. I was across the bar from him. Earl was talking to him and, and asking him something about you were involved in that, that deal down in Laguna Niguel. And old Mulligan said, well, what do you think? Unable to hear everything they're saying, Callie heads to the restaurant. Dawson follows. In the men's room, Callie asks for an update. Dawson explains that Mulligan is anxious to leave and to pick up the car from Dawson's garage. No problem. Okay. Callie tells him to go, but instructs Dawson not to get into Mulligan's vehicle. Whatever you do, don't get inside that car. Okay, don't get in the car. What don't Callie doesn't car. tell him is that agents are in the parking lot, poised to capture Mulligan. Agents finally make the first arrest in the case. As they take Mulligan into custody, they pretend to arrest Dawson as well to mask his involvement with authorities. Mulligan is charged with bank burglary. He does not resist arrest. But when agents try to question him, he refuses to talk. They hope to find answers in the car he was trying to pick up. Agents return to Dawson's house and search the car in the garage. Found this large motor used as a drill, and some other tools that we felt were very much uh, probably the ones that were used in the actual committing of the crime. Agents recover stolen coins, along with drill bits, acetylene torches, hammers, and other items that could have been used for the Laguna Niguel heist. Exactly. And we felt very good about it. Felt we hit pay dirt. We hit a home run. Evidence technicians ship everything to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for processing. As examiners take days to analyze the evidence, field agents follow up on more phone records from the motel. One number belongs to a real estate agency in Laguna Niguel, California. A manager shows agents a condo she rented to suspects Ronald and Harry Barber days before the burglary. The barbers told her they planned to stay three months, but left after only three weeks. No damage, no problems. She was able to put the day that they got there and the day they left together for us. The men moved out suddenly on March 27th, the day the crime was discovered. The manager gives investigators permission to search the condo, which is within sight of the targeted bank. Agents begin processing the condo for evidence, but initially find nothing. The entire inside had been wiped clean with some kind of a product. It seems the suspects were as meticulous there as they had been during the burglary. There was no evidence recovered at the bank of any value, and therefore, it was not surprising to see a place that had been wiped down and appears as if they had done everything to, to ensure there was no evidence. They'd done just about everything right. But in fact, they made one crucial mistake. One of the evidence persons went to the um, dishwasher and opened the dishwasher and realized that it was loaded with dirty dishes and that someone had neglected to push the on button. The dirty dishes are covered with multiple latent fingerprints. At the FBI lab, examiners recover the prints from the dishes and from the tools agents found in Mulligan's car and match them to five of the seven suspects. Tool mark experts examine the damage on the safe deposit boxes and compare them to the striking point of a snout-nosed hammer from Mulligan's trunk. 
they report another match. The FBI's case is gaining momentum with good circumstantial evidence and one suspect in custody. Now agents must find the other six and enough evidence to put them away for good. In Southern California, the FBI connects a team of seven members of an organized crime ring based in Youngstown, Ohio, to a multi-million dollar bank burglary when they recover tools used in the heist from the car of suspect Charles Mulligan. Mulligan's arrest puts the investigation into high gear, according to Special Agent Paul Chamberlain. We did realize that with the arrest of Mulligan, eventually and, and shortly thereafter, they were going to figure out that we had figured who this group was. And, and therefore, we heightened our investigation. We did everything as fast as we possibly could. But since most of the evidence is circumstantial, the case hinges on the testimony of informant Earl Dawson, a man the FBI must protect. Go ahead and leave with Warren. Okay. But whatever you do, whatever happens. Earl was probably the, the, the key witness uh, because the case was kind of dry all along. It's, it's physical evidence. It's uh, burgers are very dry. Earl was able to put all the principals together. They were charged with conspiracy and burglary, and they could put them all together at his house. Dawson begins receiving threatening phone calls, pressuring him to keep quiet. The caller insists on a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the matter. But the FBI learns the meeting may have a more sinister purpose. We received informant information uh, that a uh, contract was put out on Earl Dawson's life. And we're gonna come out and uh, to attempt to, to kill, uh, uh, kill Dawson. Agents instruct Dawson to arrange a meeting at his favorite bar, the Walnut Room. But don't tell him about the planned hit. Agents want to confront the men to send a message to the Youngstown crime ring that the FBI is on to them. Agents are confident that they can protect Dawson as long as he stays in a public place. I told Earl, don't leave the this bar. Whatever you do, don't go any place with this. You don't ever leave that room. You stay right in that bar. As before, if either Dawson or Callie needs to communicate, they will meet in the restroom. The alleged hitmen arrive. He started buying Earl some pretty heavy drinks. Earl was basically a beer drinker, but they, you could see they were trying to switch him off to, to stronger drinks. When Dawson starts to look concerned, Callie heads to the restroom. Dawson tells the agent he's scared. The hitmen want him to leave with them. I said, Earl, you're not leaving this place with him. You're leaving, you're not leaving. Agent Callie tells Dawson to wait in the restroom. Listen, stay right here, and I'll be right back to get you. Just stay right here. The agents finally approach the men. They say they know what they came to do. Time to, get out. Let's go. to the hitman, the message is clear. Stay away from Dawson. They had no problem leaving. I went directly to LAX, where they were uh, escorted uh, by LA's finest to an aircraft, and they left uh, Southern California. To keep Earl Dawson safe for good, the FBI decides to put him in the witness protection program. Gone. You're not Agents then go after the remaining burglary suspects. Investigators secure warrants to search their last known addresses. At one house, agents get their first direct link to the burglary. Inside a woman's purse, they find a new $20 bill they compare it to the list of serial numbers of sequence bills taken from the bank. It's a match. 
Special Agent Buddy Nix of the Youngstown FBI office receives information from an informant indicating that these gang members had been known to bury the cash they stole until they could launder it safely. We identified about a 20 or 25 acre field that we had information that some of the loot was buried in. Uh, we dug in that field for days on end and uh, using uh, picks and shovels and probes and uh, uh, and we finally rented a bulldozer. The land is adjacent to property owned by James Dincio. After more than a week of digging, hey. agents hit the jackpot. They unearthed several foot lockers filled with millions of dollars in cash and bonds that they're able to trace back to the Laguna Niguel bank burglary. Agents then get yet another tip. A neighbor of gang leader Emil Dincio calls police. A lot of money in there. He reports finding a cooler buried in his yard. It is filled with nearly $100,000. Right over there, Mr. Dincio. Investigators match their serial numbers to those taken from the bank and recover Emil Dincio's prints from the cooler. With more direct evidence against the gang, agents begin making arrests. They first go to Ronald Barber's Southgate, California home. They are armed with search warrants. The only person they find is Ronald's mother. The brothers have disappeared. No, I don't. I haven't seen them in All six remaining suspects are still at large. Three months after a multi-million dollar bank burglary, the FBI has solid evidence against seven members of an organized crime ring. With only one suspect in custody, Charles Mulligan, they set out to arrest the others. Emil Dincio, James Dincio, Charles Brockles, Philip Christopher, Harry Barber, and Ronald Barber. Agents go to Emil Dincio's home near Youngstown, Ohio, and discover he's made no attempt to run. Because of his attitude and his air of arrogance, Mr. Dincio actually believed he was above the law and, and was the kind of guy that um, could make things happen his way. When agents arrest Dincio, he is carrying $537 in cash stolen from the Laguna Niguel Bank. Come on, we'll call it other gang members are also surprisingly easy to find. Within days, authorities arrest Emil's brother, James Dincio, at an Ohio airport. His carry-on luggage is full of more money from the heist. Agents make their fourth arrest, nabbing Phil Christopher. In his apartment, they discover over $32,000 in stolen cash hidden in his closet. The three men arrogantly maintain their innocence and refuse to cooperate. I got a deal right here. Two months later, agents nab okay, alarm expert me. Charles Brockles and get a break. They decide to confront him with what evidence they have and explain they can put him away for decades. They offer him a deal. In exchange for his full cooperation in outlining the burglary group and their crimes, Prosecutors will drop all charges against Brockles and place him in the witness protection program. He agrees. Authorities have captured five of the seven suspects. Everyone except the Barber brothers. Authorities extradite them to California and indict them on charges of conspiracy, burglary, and larceny of a federally insured bank. While in jail, Emil Dincio brags about the heist to another inmate and asks for his help in beating the charges. Mr. Dincio confided in him a great many details that were not in his best interest to confide. He got this other inmate to help him buy an alibi for the time of the bank burglary. But Dincio has chosen the wrong accomplice. 
the other inmate was someone who had had contact with law enforcement on many occasions in the past, and he realized that what he was being told would be of some importance to someone, and he came to us. Hoping to receive a lenient sentence for his own burglary case, the inmate tells agents of Dincio's confession and the plan to purchase an alibi. And that was Vegas, Vegas. Last word is alibi. The alibi was that Mr. Dincio was going to be in a motel room, a hotel room in Las Vegas, with a prostitute and with physical evidence that would show that he was there. The FBI sets up a sting. Agents give the inmate a contact to offer Dincio. The contact is actually an undercover agent who will provide Dincio's alibi materials. Dincio takes the bait. At the jail's visitation room, he meets the undercover agent who plays the role of a fixer, a criminal expert in solving problems. Mr. Denzio received what he asked for. He got a registration card, which he registered in on. He put his fingerprint on it. He got a listing of shows, and he got the name of a prostitute who he was with, and that became part of his subsequent defense. In October 1972, the trials begin in Los Angeles. Emil Denzio offers his false alibi but the FBI's undercover fixer testifies about the sting. The jury convicts Dinzio and the other four defendants. They receive sentences ranging from 15 to 20 years. But it is not over. Two suspects, Harry and Ronald Barber, are still on the run. Within months, the FBI receives a tip that the two brothers are living in an apartment in Rochester, New York. Agents respond, and Ronald Barber answers the door. They arrest him and return him to California, where a jury convicts and sentences him to 15 years. He refuses to say where his brother Harry is. For eight years, Harry remains a fugitive. Then, in 1980, a woman in Brookville, Pennsylvania, contacts the FBI. I knew him as Brent. She tells agents that her friend has been living with a man who told her he committed a famous bank burglary in California. The other day, only because What's her name? And that his real name is Harry Barber. Harry Barber. Worried and nervous. The woman tells the FBI that in an attempt to lead a legitimate life, the fugitive is working maintenance at a local campground. Agents move in and arrest him. Hey, Barber. Hey, Barber. The FBI hands in the air. Drop the wires. Harry Barber is convicted and sentenced to 20 years. Agents can finally close the case on the largest bank burglary in United States history. Authorities believe Emil Dinzio and his gang committed more than a dozen bank burglaries, stealing over $30 million altogether. By putting them away, FBI agents from Ohio to California stopped one of the most sophisticated bank burglary rings of all time. Deep in the hills of Arkansas, an army of extremists plot to overturn the U.S. government. They spread a doctrine of hate, murder, and genocide. Launch death raids on churches and synagogues, bomb public utilities, and gun down a state trooper. Federal agents must dismantle the radical renegades without inciting a bloody war.
In 1984, a tragic murder led agents into the frightening world of domestic terrorism. Law enforcement vowed to dismantle the violent faction that claimed responsibility. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The radical group pursued a doctrine of racial cleansing, an attack on basic American freedoms. The FBI's quest for justice escalated into a brutal showdown, pitting agents against terrorists fueled by hate. June 1984, Sevier County, Arkansas, a rural area along the Oklahoma border. Winona Bryant drives south on US Highway 71. Winona is a teacher at a local high school. She's traveling with her children and her nephew to meet her husband for lunch. He is Lewis Bryant, an Arkansas state trooper. He patrols this stretch of highway. Along the way, Winona spots a police cruiser on the side of the road. She recognizes the ID number. That's Dad's car. Lewis is nowhere in sight. Something's wrong. Winona tells the children to stay in the car. Stay in the car. Then she sees him. Covered with blood. Winona struggles to stay calm as she uses the police radio to call for help. Officer down! Officer down! Police! Somebody! Officer down! Somebody! She tells the dispatcher that Lewis is unconscious. It looks like he's been shot. Just get somebody here! He's been shot! The Arkansas the State Police way. Dispatcher alerts all police frequencies that an officer is down. State 71 North. Passing motorists stop to help. Winona can feel a faint heartbeat, but her husband isn't breathing. She administers CPR until county authorities arrive. Paramedics rush Bryant to a nearby hospital where he is pronounced dead. Trooper Lewis Bryant was a respected veteran of the Arkansas State Police. He leaves behind his wife, Winona, and their two children. Within minutes of the shooting, the Dequeen, Arkansas Sheriff's Department receives a frantic call. A driver on Highway 71 reports seeing a brown and white van leaving the scene. It was pulling a homemade trailer. Police in Broken Bow, Oklahoma spot the van heading west. The driver refuses to stop, but police force him to the side of the road. As officers converge on the van, the driver pulls out a rifle and starts shooting. Police strike the suspect in the shoulder. He pulls out a 45 caliber pistol and continues firing. hit him four more times, finally forcing him down. Police 
police search the wounded suspect and find a driver's license identifying him as Richard Wayne Snell of Stephenville, Texas. At a nearby hospital, police question Snell. The suspect confesses to shooting the state trooper. Snell tells police he has outstanding warrants in Texas and he was trying to escape arrest. As Bryant approached the car, Snell opened fire. Agents from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation search Snell's van. They discover a metal box containing a 22 semi-automatic pistol and a grenade. They also find suspicious wires attached to the underside of the steering wheel column, hey, we got, we got leading to the air conditioner vent. We got, we got wires going the they fear the van is booby-trapped. Okay, Investigators call in a bomb squad from the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Technicians carefully examine the vehicle. After several tense moments, they conclude the van is not rigged to explode. The search of the vehicle resumes. Investigators find several more weapons, including a Mac-10 machine pistol. They also find literature printed by a group of white supremacists called the CSA, the Covenant, the Sword, and the arm of the Lord. You're labeling them all the same. So the group advocates the violent overthrow of the United States government. In their literature, they call for the murder of government agents and the extermination of Jews and blacks. Police call in agent Bill Buford of the ATF. Along with other federal investigators, Buford has been trying to establish a criminal case against the CSA for nearly two years. Looking for evidence, Buford makes a chilling discovery. In the van was a briefcase. And in the briefcase was a lot of notes that this individual had put together, uh, different maps. And one of the things that I noticed immediately was a map, apparently, of my house. The street it was on, the uh, different houses that surrounded my place. And uh, that caused me a little consternation, to say the least. It was later established that they had also been doing surveillance on a federal judge, a U.S. attorney, an FBI agent. For whatever reason, uh, whether they just wanted to know where we lived, or whether they were anticipating retaliation for some whatever, uh, that's just left up to one's own imagination, I guess. Buford examines the weapons retrieved from the van. One of the things that came to my attention almost immediately was that the Mac-10 had a silencer on it. The silencer is homemade but sophisticated. Bill Buford believes he has seen one just like it, confiscated just three months earlier. In early April, Missouri police caught three men stealing a flatbed trailer. In their possession were three 45 semi-automatic pistols, one sawed-off shotgun, and one Mac-10 converted to fully automatic with a homemade silencer. According to an informant, all three men are members of the CSA. The two silencers looked exactly the same. And I felt like this might be a break if we could determine that these two silencers uh, were made by the same people and were able to establish that they had come from the CSA compound. Five days after the shooting, on July 5th, 1984, Trooper Lewis Bryant is laid to rest. The funeral is attended by then-Governor Bill Clinton 
Hillary Clinton and over a thousand police officers. Governor Clinton makes the investigation of extremist groups a priority. Is to set up a, a group comprising members of both districts under the chairmanship of Colonel Goodwin to work on these cases. State and federal agents probe deeper into Snell's connection to the CSA. The murder weapon in the Bryant case was a 45 caliber Colt commander. 18 months earlier, the gun had been stolen in a deadly pawn shop holdup in Texarkana, Arkansas. The owner had been shot three times in the back of the head. Ballistics analysis shows a bullet recovered from the victim had been fired by a 22 caliber Ruger. The same 22 Ruger found in Snell's van. According to records, the leader of the CSA purchased that Ruger four years earlier. Agents now have enough evidence to subpoena the leader of the CSA to appear before a federal grand jury on gun charges. Bill Buford heads to Mountain Home, Arkansas to deliver the subpoena to the CSA leader at his 200-acre compound. Informants and surveillance indicate that the compound is heavily fortified. Several structures dot the surveillance photos. Agents know the compound is inhabited by the CSA leadership and approximately 65 men, women, and children. They know little else. ATF investigators had become aware of the CSA several years earlier. The organization had evolved from a religious group into a violent right-wing militia. When ATF began to really think that this was more than just a Bible study group was when we uh, were aware of the large number of right-wing organizations that were coming in and doing the paramilitary training there. About another 150 yards up. According to informants, uh, extremist uh, groups such as the Aryan Nation, the Posse Comitatus, and the Order frequently visited the compound. They're watching us tight, so... A few low-level members of the CSA had been arrested for firearms violations. But the leadership of the group had always managed to evade prosecution for all but misdemeanor offenses. Buford hoped today would mark the beginning of the end for this dangerous organization. Agent Buford meets a man at the front gate who identifies himself as Kerry Noble the group's second in command. He went into the compound, and a short time later he came back and said, well, the leader of the group will meet with you, but only you, and you have to go down unarmed, and I have to search you to make sure you haven't got a gun on you. Buford agrees to turn his weapon over to another ATF agent. He allows himself to be searched. He knows that going into the compound alone and unarmed is dangerous, but there's no other choice. If one of the people that was working for me or one of the agents under my supervision had wanted to do it, I wouldn't have let him do it. But uh, at the time, it seemed like the right thing. The stakes are too high. The group is too dangerous. Buford needs to show the CSA that federal agents will not be intimidated. In Arkansas, State Trooper Lewis Bryant is gunned down during a routine traffic stop. Investigators discover weapons connecting Bryant's killer to a group of violent white supremacists calling themselves the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. ATF agent Bill Buford enters the group's heavily fortified compound to deliver a subpoena, ordering the group's leader to appear before a federal grand jury. The ATF agent enters alone and unarmed. It was kind of an awesome sight. At first glance, it looked like just a community there with a number of buildings. But as you looked closer, you saw that these buildings were all rock structures. 
very well made. Uh, if you looked closely, you could see that there were bunkers dug uh, around the compound itself. Buford confronts the CSA leader face to face. I got a subpoena in my jacket. I explained to him uh, that I had a subpoena from the federal grand jury in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and uh, that he would need to appear on the date on the subpoena. The subpoena concerns weapons involved in the murder of a state trooper. Investigators have traced some of the weapons back to the CSA. He asked if he would be arrested. I assured him that grand jury appearance uh, was all this was that was not an arrest warrant, that he wouldn't be arrested. The leader takes the subpoena. His men escort Buford out of the compound. When the CSA leader eventually appears before the grand jury, he denies knowing Richard Wayne Snell, the man who confessed to the murder of Trooper Lewis Bryant. He also claims no knowledge of how weapons traced to him ended up in Snell's possession. On November 1st, 1984, Richard Wayne Snell is found guilty of capital murder in the shooting death of State Trooper Lewis Bryant. He is sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. On the same day, Snell is charged with the murder of a pawn shop owner in Texarkana, Arkansas. In the winter of 1985, the FBI, the ATF, and the Arkansas U.S. Attorney's Office turn up the heat on the CSA. FBI Special Agent Jack Knox has developed a key informant who claims the CSA is involved in acts of domestic terrorism. He outlined what he referred to as road trips in which he and two other members of the CSA were assigned by the leader of the CSA to take uh, in search of uh, businesses or establishments to plunder or Jewish establishments which they might attack. According to the informant, two years before the murder of the Arkansas State Trooper, Several CSA members had set fire to a Jewish community center in Bloomington, Indiana. The informant claimed that at about the same time, the CSA firebombed a church in Springfield, Missouri that welcomed gay members. He also claimed that three months later, the CSA attempted to bomb a major natural gas pipeline in Fulton, Arkansas, to disrupt supplies across the Midwest. They were unsuccessful. The pipeline was not damaged. But Assistant U.S. Attorney Steve Snyder could see a dangerous pattern emerging. There were what appeared to be random acts of violence. But after this individual talked, they no longer became random acts of violence. They became part of a plan to strike out against the United States and attempt to disrupt the activities of the United States and its citizens. The CSA had evolved from a religious cult into a group of domestic terrorists that had declared war on the United States. In March 1985, a second informant, a former member of the CSA, provides more information about the organization. He gives details about firearms and explosives being manufactured and used by the group. 
He tells investigators there is a machine shop in the compound where the CSA makes grenades and silencers and illegally converts semi-automatic weapons to fully automatic. He also claims the group has obtained a powerful anti-tank rocket, commonly called a law. The FBI informant reports that the CSA is building an armored tank and that landmines have been placed around the perimeter of the compound. He also provides a laundry list of interstate offenses committed by the group, including transportation of stolen vehicles, mail fraud, and theft of government property. Based on the informant's statements, the U.S. attorney pursues a warrant to search the CSA compound for illegal weapons and explosives. Assistant U.S. Attorney Snyder intends to use RICO, a federal racketeering statute, to prosecute the CSA. The statute enables authorities to arrest and convict leaders of criminal organizations based on a pattern of illegal activities. The RICO statute carried a statutory maximum penalty of 20 years, as opposed to the uh, weapons and firearms violations, which uh, carried a lesser penalty. So it was a, a more severe uh, crime. If I can show you this bigger map, maybe Investigators discuss how to best serve the warrant. Again, this is the compound. Bill Buford opposes a kick in the door approach. It was obvious to me that we were dealing with a very militant organization. They were not, in fact, going to just roll over. If we walked in and say, hey, we're the federal government, we're here to look at your compound, they weren't going to allow us to do that. To reduce the risk of a violent battle, the FBI would employ the newly formed hostage rescue team to serve the warrants. The HRT was established in 1982 as a counter-terrorism unit to work both inside and outside the borders of the United States. In 1985, Special Agent Danny Colson is the commander of the HRT. The HRT basically are assaulters. It's their job to go into a crisis point and neutralize terrorists and rescue hostages. But this was not that type of situation. Uh, these people are very well armed. And they were very formidable. And uh, we wanted to avoid a shootout. Colson establishes a command post in nearby Branson, Missouri. The HRT is composed of two elite teams. Basically, you had a sniper element and you had an operator element. The snipers were responsible for gathering intelligence to uh, give cover to uh, the operators. And the bulk of the team was made up of operators. Agent Buford, who has been inside the compound, briefs Colson on the layout the main gravel access road, the front gate, and where the property borders the shore of a man-made lake. The first phase of the operation is a reconnaissance mission. You cannot command and control a crisis situation unless the commander's done a recon. He has to go in and see the ground. He has to know what the structures are like, where they are relative to each other, and what the best avenue of approach to get there in the, in the shortest period of time is. Tonight, Colson and his team will be the uninvited guests of the CSA. In Arkansas, local and federal authorities believe an extremist group is involved in domestic terrorism. They call themselves the CSA, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. The FBI's hostage rescue team prepares to enter the terrorists' heavily fortified compound. HRT Commander Danny Colson briefs the reconnaissance team before they go in. The recon team's job is to gather intelligence on the group's infrastructure, its buildings, manpower, and weapons, while avoiding the CSA's armed patrols. ATF agent Bill Buford will act as the HRT's guide. He's been inside the compound and knows the layout. I had been doing so much work on the CSA and it's been so much time in the woods out around the compound that I had a good idea of the terrain, the fortifications on the compound, and had drawn up a raid plan myself as to 
what I felt should be done in order to execute this safely. FBI Special Agent Danny Colson knows the CSA is well armed and dangerous. These individuals had assault rifles, they had night vision capability, they had an excellent communication system, they were well trained, they practiced their tradecraft, which means marksmanship. Still, Colson has every faith in his team. The HRT has excellent patrolling skills, and it was just a matter of, of relying on our training. You move very quietly, you move very slowly, you crawl in your stomach, you stop and you listen, you look, and you rely on your senses. We would send a person on point. Uh, he would scour the area and glass it with the thermal imaging gear. You listen to the noise of the forest. If something interrupts that, you know that somebody's there that's not supposed to be. The team spots CSA guards patrolling the compound. They're armed with assault rifles. We finally signaled it was safe, and we moved the rest of the patrol in. And we sort of leapfrog in and out, and we had a rear guard to be sure that nobody came around behind us. The thing that was concerned most about, of course, is the law rocket. You don't have to be a real good shot with a law rocket to kill a lot of people. It'll take out a light tank or a bunker, fired into my perimeter, could have killed my agents. The recon team finally makes its way to the main compound. CSA members, as well as their families, are asleep inside some of the buildings. The assault team leader needed to know what the structures looked like in case we had to breach them. So you have the possibility that there could be a suicide pact with these people. And they might start killing their children. That's happened before, it's happened since then. And so we had to be prepared to go in there to rush in and save innocent lives. From the reconnaissance missions, Colson now knows exactly how the CSA compound is laid out and what needs to be done. Well, the thing that the recon really reinforced was that we don't want to assault these guys. I mean, if we had to, we could do it, but there would be great loss of lives on their side and possible on our side. The compound sits on over 200 acres of land. If Colson hopes to resolve this without bloodshed, he'll need a lot more men. After we saw how expansive this facility was there, I knew 50 men could not hold that perimeter. Colson calls for an additional 200 FBI agents from field offices across the country. He needs to sneak them into the small community without tipping off the CSA. Knowing Mountain Home, Arkansas is famous for its sports fishing, FBI agents disguise themselves as fishermen. They check into fishing camps located along the river. The plan is to use fishing boats to approach the compound at its weakest point from the lake. As agents prepare to move on the compound, Colson briefs Special Agent Clint Van Zandt of the FBI's hostage negotiation unit. You've got about five options in any type of situation. You can contain, isolate, and negotiate. You can contain and demand surrender. You can use snipers, you can use tear gas, or you can use a direct tactical assault and just overwhelm them with manpower and firepower. Uh, in these last three, people die. The decision is made to contain, isolate, and negotiate. Danny Colson is the point man on all three phases of the operation. This man views himself. I came to believe rather quickly that the leader of CSA is not going to want to negotiate 
with a lower ranking FBI negotiator, he's going to want to talk to his tactical equivalent. In this case, it's going to be Danny Coulson. And I wasn't comfortable with that. I'm a tactical person. I had been a sniper and I'd been a SWAT team member and a SWAT team leader and trained as an operator. And I was not trained to be a negotiator. And uh, I didn't know that I could pull that off. Uh, I'd much more comfortable going in after the guy than trying to talk him out. But Van Zandt convinces Colson that he's the right man for the job. I had viewed a lot of negotiations. I mean, every time a tactical team is deployed, a negotiator is deployed with them. So I'd seen it done. And uh, basically, Clint Van Zandt taught me some negotiation strategies and techniques. After 10 days of reconnaissance and planning, Special Agent Danny Colson and the FBI hostage rescue team are ready. Over 200 law enforcement agents prepare to surround one of the most dangerous and heavily armed outlaw militias in the country. In 1985, the FBI closes in on the CSA, a paramilitary organization in Arkansas. Members of the group are suspected of domestic terrorism and murder. Over 200 agents, led by the FBI's hostage rescue team, make their move. HRT snipers and operatives deploy across a lake that borders the compound. Their mission is to establish a rear perimeter. Additional HRT units fan out in the woods, flanking the main compound. The ATF, along with the Arkansas State Police and the Missouri Highway Patrol, set up roadblocks. Their job is to prevent any CSA supporters from entering or leaving the compound. Overhead, an FBI surveillance aircraft called the Night Stalker cruises at an altitude of 50,000 feet. The plane's onboard thermal imaging system monitors movement throughout the compound. FBI Special Agent Danny Colson. You could see everything going on on the ground. We saw CSA people standing and talking to each other in, in little groups around the compound. We could see every animal, every deer, every coyote, rabbits running around on the ground, which gave me a tremendous, a tremendous advantage because I could use this vehicle, this airplane, to help me set my perimeter. Uh, they could maneuver my people around listening posts. They could maneuver my people around patrols. Colson directs the mission from a command and control vehicle near the front gate of the compound. Special Agent Clint Van Zant, an FBI hostage negotiator, advises Colson. It was very prudent to go in at night and to have them wake up the next morning and find that we had walked literally right up to them without them knowing it. We could have come all the way in, but we didn't do it because we want to resolve this peacefully. HRT snipers surveil the compound from positions inside and near the main gate. Within 10 minutes, they report that two men are exiting the compound and approaching their position. Sniper one to command first. Roger. Instruction, please have individuals coming out of the compound gate. Stand by. Standing by for instruction. And I radioed back and said, do they know you're there? He said, no, they haven't seen us yet. The sniper tells Colson that one man has an assault rifle, the other has a sidearm. Individuals getting closer, command post, instructions, please. Colson instructs his men to confront the CSA guards. I said, you hail them, you yell at them, and tell them you're the FBI, and tell them to go back inside. You copy, tell them to get back inside the compound. The message it sends is that we could have got you, but we chose not to do it. Basically, we, we are here in force but we come in peace. FBI, back in the compound, now! FBI, get back in the compound! Move, move! Move, move! 
one then get in the habit of following my orders or the orders of my team and to show them that we weren't there to hurt them. We're hearing from the tactical agents that there are lights, that there are activities within the compound. We'll go with you. Now, you better stay back here. Moments later, another man walks out of the compound. Who's out here? I instructed him to let him get close, and I wanted two operators to take him into custody. FBI, free! Don't move! I didn't order him back in because I wanted to start the dialogue. It's time to talk now. Sometimes one of the most difficult things about a standoff situation is finding somebody to talk to. You don't always get them to talk to you initially. The man identifies himself. He's Kerry Noble, the deputy commander of the CSA. The first thing I said to him is we need to start a dialogue and talk about resolving this thing peacefully. We're not here to hurt anybody. But you're not getting out. And if you start a war, we're going to end it. Noble says he will convey the FBI's request to talk with his commander. At daybreak, federal agents and local police have completely surrounded the compound. The news media somehow gets hold of the story and converges along access roads. Agents establish a direct telephone line into the compound. A short time later, Agent Colson receives a call. The operator called me over and said, it's, uh, it's him, and it was the leader. Yellow, that's right, I'm turned over. And essentially said the same thing that I'd said to his deputy, is that this is the FBI, my name is Danny Colson, we have a warrant for your arrest. And the, only way it's gonna happen the leader agrees to come out and talk on one condition that he will not be arrested. Otherwise, his people will put up a fight. Okay. Colson agrees you to the it. terms. Five minutes, I'll see you then. Van Zandt prepares Colson for the meeting. As an expert in behavioral science, Van Zandt believes the CSA leader will only respond to another commander. As a military commander, I said, you, you wouldn't be carrying a long gun, a rifle, in this type of meeting, but you'd have your nine millimeter pistols. You'll meet his expectation as to what our FBI tactical commander should look like. He'll be more open to dialogue, more open to negotiations. Colson approaches the main gate. You should always look like you're in charge, but also you have to, to bring him out. You have to get him to talk. It's not just you walk up and give demands, you get him to talk to you. Tensions mount for a possible violent confrontation. FBI snipers train their sights on the CSA leader and his guards. And you have to understand that this is a man who thought we were literally from the devil, that we were agents of the devil. So trying to create a bond of trust on a road with two armies facing each other with awesome firepower is a difficult thing to do. Colson tells the CSA leader that the FBI is there to confiscate grenades, assault rifles, the law, anti-tank rocket, all illegal weapons stored in the compound. I really didn't describe the forces. I just said, we're here, we've been here, we know what's going on in there, and at this point, I wanted to remain the faceless enemy. What I got from him was dialogue, which is the most important thing. But what I didn't get was capitulation. He didn't agree to do anything. He just agreed that they would go back in and pray about it. Well, I respect that. We'd agreed earlier if he came out that he could go back in. And that's very important. Uh, you have to keep that trust. Colson and Van Zant have no choice but to honor their agreement. They allow the leader to go back inside the compound. The first day and night of the siege passes without incident or resolution. On day two of the siege, the CSA commander requests another meeting. This time, he appears in full battle dress.
Changing clothing is a big deal. When the leader of CSA puts on tactical clothes, he's taking the presence of a tactical commander. The leader of the CSA tells Colson that there are people inside the compound who are prepared to launch an assault and break out. And my patience was wearing really thin at this time. And uh, I said to him, who are you going to fight? You've not seen us. You don't know where we are. We are going to use deadly force on you if you come out with weapons and, and come onto my perimeter. Who are you going to shoot? You haven't even seen us yet. How are you going to shoot us? It's like you're fighting ghosts, and you won't even know who kills you. You need to come out of there. Now you get in there and convince them to get out of here right now. The leader tells Colson he is prepared to come out, but he can't control everyone in the compound. And he said to me, I need help. He said, there's a man that, that's our spiritual leader, and I need his advice, and I need, I need his help to convince people that's the thing to do to come out. And I said, who is this? He said, it's Robert Millar. Robert Millar is a well-known figure in the secretive world of right-wing extremists. It's an unusual demand. But to Van Zant, it's a turning point in the negotiation. This situation was either going to be resolved by bullets or it was going to be resolved by trust. Bullets or trust, what's it going to be? For Colson, it is the moment of truth. He knows that if the shooting starts, there is no telling when it will stop. In the mountains of Arkansas, over 200 law enforcement agents surround an armed compound. Inside are a group of violent right-wing extremists, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. The leader of the CSA demands to see Robert Millar, their spiritual leader. FBI Special happen. Agent Danny Colson decides to use Millar to help persuade CSA members to leave the compound. This is something totally against FBI policy, to bring in a Confederate into a crisis situation, not just to negotiate, but to go inside. And this is a huge risk, and I thought it was worth taking given the risk that we were facing. The FBI flies Millar in from Oklahoma. Special Agent Clint Van Zant tries to convince Millar that it will be in the group's best interests if he helps bring the standoff to an end. I said, you know, if you're able to do this, if you're able to resolve this peacefully, you'll be known as the peacemaker within your movement. I said, I don't say that to win you over. I say to tell you that you've got a lot riding on this. And you can see the wheels turning. It was at that moment I thought, he's flipped over on our side. He's on our side. He's going to do it. This was all the chips. We're saying, we're going to bet on this guy that he's going to drive home the message that Danny and myself and everybody else has been delivering for the last four days. Now, he's got to close the deal. And he called on the field phone. And Millar said, well, I'm in here talking to them, but I really haven't got anything resolved. They said, OK, you got another hour. Well, really, we couldn't control him. What are we going to do, go in and grab him by the neck and rip him out of that compound where there was 50 people with guns inside? So you had to be real careful of not, you will be out of there, because then it would have been apparent we were an empty suit. We were a paper tiger, and we couldn't be perceived as that. So it had to be. Well, I really need you out of there in an hour. And uh, he called back in an hour, and he said, I need, I need more time with these folks. I think I can do it. I've got them coming along, but, but I need more time. And we just reconciled ourselves that he's going to stay there the night. On the morning of April 22nd, day four of the siege, Millar and the CSA leadership exit the compound. For the first time since the beginning of the standoff, there are no armed men with the CSA leader. They came out and they said, we have an agreement that we will surrender. We will come out 
and we'll give up our arms and walk out peacefully. Colson receives the news with guarded optimism. And I said to them, that's a great decision, but I want you to understand that this better not be a ruse for an escape attempt because you will not survive it. This better be a surrender. Colson gives the leader 15 minutes to gather his people and bring them out. And very shortly after, I get a, a communication from my sniper team that they're coming. They're coming out. The snipers report that they're in uh, civilian attire. There's no camis. There's no, there's no battle gear. There's no weapons they can see. The siege is over. Not a single shot has been fired. It was an ending that we had all prayed for, and one that we were very fortunate that we had. ATF and FBI agents carefully search the compound, accompanied by the deputy commander of the CSA, Kerry Noble. Over the course of several days, they recover hundreds of automatic weapons, homemade hand grenades, and landmines, as well as detonator boxes and plastic explosives. Agents find a long anti-tank rocket near the leader's house. They find 30 gallons of cyanide stored inside steel drums. Agents believe the CSA intended to use it to pollute municipal water supplies. Investigators also find a steel-plated armored car equipped with a fully automatic machine gun. At trial, the leader of the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord is sentenced to 20 years in prison for federal RICO violations. Kerry Noble, the CSA's deputy commander, receives a five-year sentence for firearm violations. Today, he speaks publicly about the dangers of hate groups and destructive cults. Richard Wayne Snell, already serving a life sentence for the murder of Arkansas State Trooper Lewis Bryant, is found guilty of murdering a pawn shop owner. He is sentenced to death. On April 19, 1995, at 9.16 p.m., Snell is executed by lethal injection. Today, the CSA compound is little more than a collection of abandoned shacks and stone ruins. A string of lethal carjackings terrorized the Washington, D.C. area. Ballistics reveal that it's the work of a serial killer who tries to run over one victim with his own car. The FBI and police set a clever trap, but the killer insists on a violent shootout. a serial killer stalked lone victims in the dead of night, his hunting ground the suburbs of Washington, D.C., his target, anyone who owned a car. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The gunman was as elusive as he was deadly. He struck quickly and without mercy. Now the FBI must follow the twisted path of a killer wherever it leads. November 13th, 1991. Silver Spring, Maryland, a suburb north of Washington, D.C. 
Montgomery County Police respond to a report of shots fired at a car dealership. Officers discover the body of a woman shot in the chest and forehead. And another gunshot victim nearby. The man is breathing but unconscious. Paramedics rush him to the hospital. Montgomery County homicide detective Ed Day coordinates his department's swift response to the slaying. You saturate the case as fast as you can, work on it as fast as you can, get as much information as fast as you can, and try to resolve it as fast as you can. Uh, unfortunately, the homicides, uh, time is terrible. The more time goes by, the less your odds are that you're going to have a satisfactory conclusion to the investigation. Investigators learn the two victims are janitors. They were cleaning the building that night and would have come outside around 10 p.m. to dump the garbage. The detectives work to determine a motive for the attack. You don't overlook the obvious. You have a shooting like this at a car lot. Uh, is that a possible uh, motive for the killing, the theft of a car? Of course, had representatives from the auto dealer come out, uh, do an inventory. There was no vehicles missing. Uh, there was no property missing from the inside of the establishment. Investigators locate the victim's car keys nearby and determine neither of their personal vehicles are missing. Robbery does not seem to be the motive. Nothing was taken. They had money on them. Uh, there wasn't a single thing missing. Are you Mr. Escobar's attendant position? Yes, I am. With almost no evidence to go on, Detective Day hopes to learn more from the critically wounded man. As you can see, he's innovated. He's also in a coma, and he's just not responding. We do that with all any kind of a, a shooting that's potentially fatal. Uh, there's a rule in law that a dying declaration does not have to be corroborated. It's not hearsay because if the person knows he's going to die, he's assumed to be able to be telling the truth. Uh, so if you can get a, a, a statement from somebody in really serious uh, circumstances, and it's always a very, very powerful piece of evidence. But, I gotta check on but the victim dies nine days later without ever regaining consciousness. During the autopsy, the medical examiner recovers the only piece of physical evidence, the bullets that killed the victims. At the Maryland State Police Crime Lab, ballistics expert Joe Capera examines the evidence to determine if there was more than one shooter. There was a microscopic uh, comparison done to determine if these bullets were fired from the same gun. And indeed, as a conclusion to these examinations, I, I concluded that these bullets were fired from the same gun. Examining the scratch patterns on the bullets, Capera determines the make and model of the murder weapon. I was able to ascertain, first of all, the caliber of the gun, which was a 357 and then through the measurements of the unique uh, land and groove areas, I was able to ascertain that it was a Ruger 357. With no obvious motive for the slayings, detectives explore the victims' personal lives for clues. If you work inside out, you try to find out if these people had any uh, enemies, if there was any triangle, you know, a thwarted lover or something like that. These things take you in a hundred different directions, and you just have to, you have to take care of one thing at a time. You eliminate something, and you move on to the next issue, and you just go from there. Detectives find nothing in the victims' backgrounds that could have led to their murders. Since investigators found the victims' car keys near the bodies, they decide to re-examine the slayings as a failed car theft. With that possible motive in mind, detectives speculate how the crime might have occurred. 
They were cleaning. The business was closed for the night. They were uh, taking the trash out. Hey! Detectives suspect the gunman demanded the victim's car keys. The keys. Here, it's right here. Don't, don't hurt me, okay? Based on the position of the woman's body relative to her keys, they believe she tried to run. And you have to make the assumption that he lost control of the situation and decided to kill the two of them before he identified what car belonged to them. He escalated an attempt theft into a murder for no good reason. With little evidence to go on, the case grows cold. Then, three months later, investigators respond to the scene of another homicide. They find the body of psychology professor Dr. Shaheen Hastrudi lying in a parking lot in Bethesda, Maryland. Unable to locate her car, detectives believe she was the victim of a fatal carjacking. Noting the lack of blood spatter evidence near the body, they suspect Hastrudi's assailant shot her while she was still inside her car. Through interviews with her colleagues, authorities determined Dr. Hestrudi left her office around 8 p.m. She's obviously uh, accosted. At some point, gets in her car. Get in that car! Start the car! Start the car! Start the car! Start the car! Don't touch her! Once she's already in the car, she shot. She's taken out of the car, dumped on the on the lot, and the suspect steals her car. Gunshot wound to the head. Large caliber. No witnesses. The only solid evidence is a pair of bullets recovered from the victim's body. Investigators send the bullets to the Maryland State Police Crime Lab to compare them with the bullets from the double homicide. It is a match. The two crimes are connected. So we got a couple of crimes here. Homicide detectives begin examining unsolved cases involving similar circumstances. One detective recalls a recent homicide, which occurred a month before Hastrudi was killed. That victim was also shot in the head with a large caliber gun. As in the Silver Spring double homicide, responding officers found the victim's keys near his body. But this victim didn't own a car, which leads investigators to question whether car theft was the motive, or if the case is even connected to the other shootings. But we said, you know, this is looking like they're definitely linked for some reason. Let's see if we can get some ballistics on. Let's get some ballistics on. So authorities locate the bullet from that case and send it to be tested. Ballistics expert Joe Capera compares the bullets from the four homicides. I did a cross comparison examination to the previous bullets. And as a result of that examination, I found out that all the bullets were fired from the same weapon. So we're starting to see a pattern here, guys. So we got we got, we got Investigators have connected the four homicides through the ballistic evidence and an apparent car theft motive, but they cannot understand why the killer chose to murder his victims. None of these people were armed. Stature-wise, none of these people I thought were particularly a threat to uh, the suspect. 
two possibilities. He had lost control of him and felt the best way to regain control of the situation was to kill him, or there was some uh, psychological reason that he didn't like these particular people. Detectives believe they are dealing with an extremely violent and unpredictable criminal and suspect he may still be in the area. Montgomery County was his basis of operation. That's where he felt he most comfortable. Me. That's where he did all his murders. That's where he did his, you know, his most risky business. That's where he laid in wait for people. Uh, so it was obvious he had some strong tie to Montgomery County. Investigators suspect he will strike again and hope to stop him before he does. But they have no clues that can help identify him. And the killer's weapon is the only thing that can connect him to the murders. The best evidence we got is the bullets. And if we can get him and get the gun, then we have definitely have a very, very strong case. Authorities don't want to give the killer a reason to destroy his gun, and with it, their only evidence. So they decide to keep the ballistics match away from the media. If we supply the information to the press that all the bullets came from the same gun, it'd be a good likelihood that he would either dispose of the, the weapon or he would, in worst case scenario, obtain a different weapon and keep committing the crime. More than a week after the Hestrudi killing, a man wearing a stocking mask and latex gloves robs a bank in Chantilly, Virginia. The bank's video security system captures his image. tells the FBI that the bank robber fled in a late model white vehicle and gives them the license plate number. The description of the getaway car matches the vehicle stolen from Hestrudi, attracting the attention of Montgomery County detectives. But the license plate is not Hestrudi's. Investigators trace the plate and discover it had been stolen from a vehicle in Annandale, Virginia. For detectives, this leaves open the possibility that Hestrudi's car was used in the bank robbery. The Montgomery County Task Force, which now includes agents from the FBI, requests copies of the bank's surveillance tapes to learn what they can about the robber. Investigators watch the crime unfold and notice the robber is carrying a revolver of the same make and caliber used in the four homicides. They think he could be the killer. The footage is the best lead they have in identifying a suspect, according to FBI Special Agent Robert Coffey. We had a great piece of video that actually showed the individual the handgun. That picture was actually put on the news locally and, and regionally to try to see if we could spark some interest as far as someone identifying him. Investigators also release information that their suspect, the money he stole, and the vehicle he was driving may be covered in red dye. The teller managed to uh, slip dye packs into the, uh, the bag of money. And a dye pack is, uh, is a device that once it goes through the door of the bank, it's electronically activated. There's a timer on it. It gives a person a little bit of time to get away from the, the bank, and then it explodes, spewing this terrible red dye. It stains. It's very difficult to get off. It gets on the money, and it can't, will not come off the money. It takes a while to get it off you personally. Five days after the bank robbery, Police in Northern Virginia find an abandoned car bearing the stolen plates reported by the witness. 
A check of the vehicle identification number proves that it is Estrudi's car. The officer peers inside, examining the interior. We had uh, the red dye stains in it from the dye packs from the bank. We had proof positive that it had been used in the bank robbery. Officers impound the vehicle and transport it to the police garage for processing. Technicians find blood stains inside the car and collect samples as evidence. But they do not find anything that can identify the killer. Lab examiners extract DNA from the blood evidence and compare it to Hestrudis. It is a match. Finally, investigators are able to look at the various crimes and understand their suspect's overall plan. It's gelled into something that makes a little bit of sense. You went from a situation where you had a whole bunch of motives that really didn't make sense to now a concrete motive. This person is killing people to steal cars to commit bank robberies. Although authorities now understand why the suspect is murdering innocent people, they have no clue who he is. Investigators face the nearly impossible challenge of identifying and catching a ruthless gunman before he kills again. The FBI and Maryland's Montgomery County Police are hunting a killer who has already committed four homicides, as well as a bank robbery. Several FBI agents are part of the task force pursuing the gunman, including Special Agent Robert Coffey. One of the main roles of the FBI, specifically in this type of a crime, is that we work with many different agencies to corral all of the investigators and bring forth the information in one kind of a think tank. This multi-agency approach is an invaluable investigative resource for Montgomery County homicide detective Ed Day. When you start working with multiple jurisdictions on different cases, well, the more jurisdictions are involved, the more jurisdictions have an interest, the more assets you can draw from. The task force now understands their suspect's crime pattern. He steals a person's car at gunpoint, killing his victim, then uses the vehicle in a bank robbery. Investigators continue to look for past unsolved cases that involved a similar pattern. Nothing occurs in a vacuum. Uh, somebody doesn't just start killing people, so that's when we really start doing the research. They identify an incident that occurred in their county almost a year earlier. Is your car? No, it's not my car. Our victim was a uh, maintenance man, an Hispanic male. He was uh, accosted by a white male carrying a large caliber dark handgun. Where's your car? When the masked gunman asked for the victim's car keys, the man claimed he didn't own a car. Oh, no. The suspect demanded to know which car belonged to him. He was told to turn around and face away from the suspect, no. get down on his knees and put his hand behind his head. Where's your car? Where's your car? No, Our victim at that time felt quite certain that he was going to be executed. It's better for your car. Suspect fired three shots. Uh, one of the shots hit him in the forearm. The victim managed to flee down an alley and hide behind a bush. And spent some minutes there waiting for the situation to calm down. After 10 minutes, the victim returned to the street and waved down the first car he saw, hoping for assistance. To his horror, it was the gunman. Alert neighbor had called police. 
the victim's life was spared. The following day, a witness reported seeing a masked gunman leaving the scene of a bank robbery in Centerville, Virginia. Police later recovered the getaway vehicle and determined it was the car stolen from the maintenance man. Investigators examined the evidence gathered at the scene of the carjacking. All they have is a bullet fragment that was lodged in the victim's arm. Ballistics expert Joe Capera. One does not necessarily need the whole bullet as long as the fragment that is left that he is examining has enough ballistic evidence on it that he can use. He tests the fragment against the other recovered bullets to determine if that case is connected to their current investigation. The bullet fragment matches, but the task force is still no closer to identifying their suspect. The lab's not getting anything out of these. No, I mean, these I mean, cars are... With little hard evidence, investigators study the killer's behavior as exhibited through his actions, searching for clues to his identity. Authorities examine the newly linked case and determine he is unusually bold and cocky. When the investigators got together and discussed the commitment level of this individual to stay at a crime scene for 10 minutes waiting for a witness to come back, um, raised our level of concern about the subject himself. He's not in a big hurry. It feels pretty comfortable that the police aren't going to be there anytime soon. Investigators also believe the suspect has a quick-tempered, vengeful personality. He's very upset with his victim. He's decided that uh, he has been himself wronged in some way, and he's going to uh, make him pay for it. But authorities cannot understand why the suspect uses what appears to be an unnecessary level of violence during the carjackings. It does not make sense to kill somebody in the least risky part of the crime. The biggest risk he's taken is when he goes into those banks, as far as getting captured, being identified, or running into any real obstacles. Taking these people, you know, innocent people off in the middle of the night in, in, in a ground of his own choosing where he can isolate them, I mean, he's safer at that location than he is at any, anywhere else and anything else he does. So it just doesn't make sense why he chose to, to kill these people. Their suspect is not only dangerously disturbed, but also clever. Yeah, we'll just pull in here. So One of the more interesting parts of uh, the MO that this individual used was the number of jurisdictions through which he perpetrated his crimes. He exploits the fact that no single police department can readily see his entire crime pattern. We have a carjacking in one jurisdiction. We have a stolen tag from a second jurisdiction. We have a bank robbery in a third jurisdiction. And then we have the car abandoned in a fourth jurisdiction. The gunman's efforts to stymie police do not stop there. Each time he abandons a stolen car, he leaves it unlocked with the keys in plain view. One of the difficult parts of recovering the vehicles following the robberies is that they were being driven by other people. By leaving the vehicle with the keys in it, the vehicles were then subsequently restolen. Leaving the vehicles to be restolen destroyed whatever forensic evidence would have been left behind. So the only thing we had to match all of the crimes was the forensic evidence from the ballistics. This Investigators continue to look for additional unsolved carjackings in which the vehicle was later used in a bank robbery. They identify a case that occurred within miles of the other thefts. A woman was walking out of a doctor's office and realized that she was being followed. She turned to try to go back to the doctor's office, but was confronted by the individual. 
and then ask for her keys. They walked over to the car. Come on, come on, come on. Start it. Start the car. Start the, the gunman car. forced start the frightened the woman to start her car. And upon starting the vehicle, had her get out and kneel down next to a wall. On your knees. Upon kneeling down, he had her wait there for a short period of time. She described as 30 or 40 seconds passed. You have to wonder is it how long, much of that time did he spend thinking about whether or not he was going to shoot her. She was very compliant, did everything she was told to do right when she was told to do it. That might have saved her. The next day, her vehicle was used in a bank robbery. The investigators wonder why their suspect allowed this woman to live, yet killed the others. They come up with several theories. The fact that she was a Caucasian female might have had something to do with it. He might have had uh, harbored some malice towards uh, Hispanic people or foreign people, or uh, it could be something simple about he lost control in those situations. In fact, the best way to get, gain control was to kill him. The task force has little to work with, but is determined to go on the offensive. Now we're trying to figure out how can we get ahead of him? How can we be in a position where we can be waiting for him when he does something? Or we can be prepared to mobilize very quickly with the resources necessary to get him. The investigators focus on the one aspect of the suspect's crime pattern that they can anticipate. You could not predict when a carjacking would take place. They were too random. We did, however, know that following the carjacking, we would have a bank robbery. If authorities can only predict which banks he will rob or where he will be traveling, they might have a chance to catch him. A masked gunman strikes again and again in suburban Maryland just north of the nation's capital. He shoots his victims while stealing their cars. Which he later uses to rob banks. In the spring of 1992, the FBI and Montgomery County Police analyzed their suspect's habits in hopes of trapping him. Homicide detective Ed Day. We had people take aerial photographs of every crime scene and the different uh, escape routes and things of that nature, trying to find some logical pattern to what he was doing, something that would maybe give us a clue what are consistencies? What are inconsistencies? Is there anything like that that we can use to our advantage to, to foretell what he might do next? On the surface, the list of crime scenes appears random. But a closer look by investigators reveals all the banks he robbed share a single trait. Everywhere he went, he had access to a major roadway. They would take him pretty quickly to a thoroughfare like 495 or 270 or something like that. The task force shifts their focus from predicting where the suspect will strike next to catching him when he makes his escape after a bank robbery. They decide they will cast a dragnet on all highway exit ramps in the area. FBI Special Agent Robert Coffey. We developed a plan where we would cast a net using all of the jurisdictions, the law enforcement within the Washington area, to where once the bank robbery were to take place, he would have to pass through some points of the net. Meeting with officers from every police department in the area, the task force details their plan. 
incidents reports from the murders, and I'm going to pass them out. They will watch for any carjacking reports resembling their suspect's M.O. Officers from each jurisdiction will then prepare for a quick response if a bank is subsequently robbed. They will immediately stake out pre-assigned highway exit ramps targeting the stolen car. Once he's carjacked the vehicles, and we implement the plan. There was enough support at each particular location that he could be followed. Uh, we could bring to bear enough additional uh, manpower to make a stop of our choosing and, uh, of course, uh, effect an arrest if we were lucky enough to spot him. Ready to cast their net, investigators wait for the suspect to steal a car. Your key players in the plan, let's get them. At 5 a.m. each morning, Special Agent Coffey begins his day by reviewing the reports of all the area car thefts from the night before. He looks for the one that matches their suspect's M.O. If the suspect stole a car, the task force needs to identify it before banks open at 9. But months pass with no sign of their suspect. Investigators begin to worry that the killer has gone underground and may never be caught. We assume he's obviously stressed at this particular point. He's feeling the, the heat of the notoriety of what he's done. October 9th, 1992. Special Agent Coffee. Eight yes. months after the killer's most recent slaying, I get notification from our Baltimore agents that another carjacking has taken place. We've got a white male with a ski mask, latex gloves, and a handgun. Uh, it's taken place all the way up in Baltimore. At approximately 7 a.m., a 15-year-old a girl walked to her mother's car. Suddenly, an armed man approached her and demanded the keys. Officer heard this and came to her aid. Get away from the car! 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 There was an exchange of gunfire. And the carjacker took her vehicle and fled the scene. We were feeling very good because we had uh, very, very fresh information and we knew he was on the move and he was in Baltimore and more than likely on the way back here. The task force determines there is no need to wait for a bank robbery. Based on that information, the task force casts the net around the Washington metro area, hoping that he's going to come back through that net. Patrolmen and SWAT units from jurisdictions throughout Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Northern Virginia race to prearranged locations on freeway exit ramps to watch for the stolen car. Since police cannot be sure if the suspect has had time to switch the license plates, they pull over every vehicle matching its description. They know they may face a shooter who has already taken four lives. The FBI and police departments throughout the Washington, D.C. area hunt a suspected killer. They stop every vehicle matching the description of the one they believe he stole an hour earlier. Police pull over dozens of cars would come up empty. What's going on? You got a girl. As the search continues, 50 miles away in western Maryland, 
Brunswick police officer Gary Klein is on routine patrol. I observed a small uh, black and color passenger vehicle. I saw that there was no front license plate on it. And as the vehicle passed me, I looked over and observed the driver had a nylon stocking pulled down over his face. It kind of shocked me and I was like, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on here, but it kind of drew my attention real quick. I turned around, caught back up to the car, radioed my dispatchers, and uh, the 911 center requested uh, information on the tag. And uh, the subject in the small black car sped off and wouldn't pull over for me. Then I'm informed by our dispatchers that this subject is wanted for uh, shooting at a Baltimore City officer. The hundreds of officers mobilized in the D.C. area are too far away to assist. Officer Klein is alone against a ruthless killer. The adrenaline's pumping now because I'm pursuing this vehicle. Um, knowing somewhere in there I'm going to have to confront this individual. The speeds that we um, maintained in some places were 90 mile per hour to uh, a little over 100 mile per hour. Officer Klein chases the suspect from Maryland into Virginia. He was very intent on getting away from me. Dispatcher, we're getting ready to go right on Interstate 71. He just went straight down the middle of the bridge, just forcing people east and westbound out of his way. I had to back off because I didn't want to endanger myself or the innocent people or citizens out on the street where he was actually able to gain a good bit of distance on me. But once the roadway cleared up a little bit where I could safely get through the vehicles, uh, I was able to catch back up to him. Klein pursues the suspect into West Virginia. Made a right off Route 340 and he went down this small asphalt road and when he hit that, he was going too fast with the rain and everything and lost control and struck the curb. Stepped out of the vehicle with my weapon drawn. And I seen him kind of lean over in the car towards the passenger seat and I seen the gun come up in, inside the car. Officer Klein is concerned about firing his gun in a public place. When you discharge your weapon, you just don't want a, a round just going out there somewhere, and you could strike somebody innocent. You have a split second to make this decision, and whatever decision you make can affect you for the rest of your life. At that point, he uh, placed the car in reverse and sped backwards quickly towards my cruiser in what I believe was an attempt to, to ram my car or strike me. proceeded down a uh, small access route. And I proceeded after him. He sped into the uh, this little dead end dirt gravel area and he tried to go behind this bulldozer and wrecked into it. There's nowhere for him to go and now I have to confront him. At that time I see the gun coming up which just kind of made my heart jump out of my chest. While the suspect ducks for cover, Officer Klein strategically moves to his right. You don't want to stay in one position, especially after he already knows where you're at. Klein's tactic works. The suspect fires at the position where Klein used to be. I actually fired more shots at him as he ran to get to the backside of his car for cover. With backup units still minutes away, the lone officer fights to stay alive in a violent face-off with a vicious killer. The suspected killer is in a desperate shootout in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, with lone police officer Gary Klein. I see him start to come up from behind his car through the passenger side window with the gun raised and he's coming up. I remember firing at him and um, striking the car and he ducked down behind the car again. 
several seconds passed. He um, raises back up. You can hear it, the actual sound of the bullet striking the car, the metal, and he ducks back down behind the car again. Finally, backup arrives. When they put their hand on my shoulder and I knew who they were, it was this big relief. A burden was lifted off my shoulders because now I knew I had fellow officers there. Within the next 10 minutes, police officers from several jurisdictions were on the scene. Come out from behind the car. The gunman realizes he is outnumbered. Then the suspect stood up and walked out in front of myself and my cruiser, probably about 15 yards, and put the gun to his head. And I continued to yell at him to drop the gun, to throw the gun on the ground. At which time he told me he wouldn't do that. Listen, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. West Virginia State Police Corporal John Jeffries begins negotiating with the gunman. We can work through this. Let me help. After several minutes of negotiation, the suspect then pulled the um, nylon stocking up on the top of his head. Still wasn't able to really get a good, clear look at him. The suspect begins to talk. He says he's an unemployed house painter. He said that he was just upset. He had had some relation problems with his girlfriend, um, that he had done some things he wasn't real happy about, and just. All these things had piled up and just troubled him, and he didn't know why he was doing the things he, were, he was doing. After a 45-minute standoff, the gunman makes an unusual demand. I remember him saying he wanted to talk to his mother. So he gave up his mother's name and phone number. Several tense minutes pass as police attempt to reach the suspect's mother. He advised uh, the suspect that they had his mother on the phone. The woman on the line asks the negotiator for the suspect's name. He identified himself as Alan Newman. He wasn't real sure of the police. He didn't know if we were just lying to him or what we were doing. He said, well, ask my mom what my favorite cookie is. I remember Corporal Jeffries saying, uh, your mom said your favorite cookie is chocolate chip. And he started crying. It really shocked me because I thought he was just going to drop the gun and give up. You, you see the hammer coming back, and everything's like slow motion. You see the hammer drop. You're waiting for the gun to go off. And it didn't. Seizing the opportunity, officers rush in and subdue the gunman, ending the standoff. After it was all over and done, um, very relieved, very appreciative of all of the guys that were there that day. I was able to help to get this person off the street and um, put him where he needed to be so that nobody else would be, would be hurt. Police take Alan Newman into custody and confiscate his Ruger 357 as evidence. It is the same model used in the murders, according to FBI Special Agent Robert Coffey. From the prior ballistics, we knew what type of gun it would be. It would have been a specific Ruger make, and in fact, that's what he was carrying. Um, the same types of bullets that were used in the shootings and the homicides were, in fact, still in the weapon. You have told us that over and over. After nearly a year of hard work, investigators finally meet the killer face to face. We no longer have someone running throughout the counties killing people for cars. Um, we were very uh, excited about getting the chance to talk to the individual to find out why. Go ahead. While Newman admits to the Baltimore carjacking, he refuses to admit to any of the murders, according to homicide detective Ed Day. Throughout the uh, interview process, he remained pretty cocky, and uh, you know, he thought he was pretty cool. 
Investigators continue to press Newman. While at a firearms laboratory, a ballistics expert fires Newman's gun into an 800-gallon tank of water. The examiner compares the unique markings on the fired bullet to those on the bullets recovered from the four murders and the attempted homicide. Ballistics expert Joe Capera. It is a scientific certainty that this is the firearm that fired these bullets, and no other firearm could possibly do that. You want to hear it again? After hours of interrogation, investigators receive the ballistics report. That's like uh, the magic piece of evidence. So that's the one that you really knew would seal the, the whole case. We had physical, undeniable evidence that we could put in front of a jury that he could not refute in any way, shape, or form. we could convict him uh, without much trouble and we could have gotten the death sentence with the information that we had, which put it over the top and he decided it was best to uh, make a deal for life rather than take the chance on uh, being executed. Alan Newman pleads guilty to all the charges against him and is sentenced to five life terms without parole, plus 100 years for handgun violations. Looking back, it was the collective efforts of more than a dozen police agencies contributing interviews and evidence that led to the successful conclusion of this case. The accomplishment for all police officers and all investigators is to, to arrest the bad guy and put him in jail. And when you do that, you get a nice warm feeling for about 10 minutes until the next case comes in and you have to start all over again. But for now, Every investigator who worked this case is content to know they have ended one man's violent rampage. <laughs>